Greetings, humans, and welcome back to my line. Welcome back to my channel. I'm shooting this video without a beanie. Oh, my hair doesn't look like shit. Is this sustainable? Who knows? Probably not. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big shout out to this video's sponsor, Monsanto. Monsanto, we literally don't give one fuck about you. My name is Ryan, and I have one quick question. How can you make the greatest positive impact on the greatest number of people with the greatest frequency? Or put another way, if you prefer to ask yourself, what is the biggest problem that I can reasonably contribute to solving given my unique set of experiences, skills, and interests? As one of my ex-best friends used to say, and mind you, he didn't go anywhere. He just sort of morphed into an insufferable finance douche. Shout out to Eric Feldman. It's the easiest thing in the world to look around and say, everything is messed up, but it's a lot harder to come up with solutions about how to change it. When faced with the incredible suffering and insanity all over the world, and confronted with the relative insignificance of one person compared with billions on the planet, it can be very overwhelming. To the point where you might feel helpless, and checking out seems like the safest and easiest answer. As far as I can tell, nothing has a larger and more consistent impact on every aspect of our lives than the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the food that we cram into our face holes. Now, obviously food is a source of nutrition and enjoyment and community, but it's also something much larger. It can definitely be argued that the only reason we have anything in our society, things like camera equipment or iPhones or electricity or plumbing, is because at some point, some people had enough of a sense of security about where their basic needs were going to be coming from that they had the ability to kind of focus on things that were a little bit more long-term. They had the ability to focus on bigger picture problems other than how am I gonna feed myself and where am I gonna sleep tonight? Basic needs can be discussed as the bottom rungs of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Things like air, water, food, shelter, clothing, sleep, and then the second rung, health, employment, property, family, and stability. If you have your basic needs met, only then do you have the luxury to concern yourself with longer term goals or planning. For all the posturing and the celebration of freedom in this country, it's my opinion that true freedom begins on the third rung of Maslow's hierarchy. Ask yourself, what do most people work for? And I'm not talking about the few who are fortunate enough to be working on something that they really care about or who were lucky enough to just have millions in the bank already. But what do most people work for? They work in order to obtain money, and then they trade that money for their most basic needs for themselves and their family. They need money so that they can pay rent and buy food, so they don't starve, so they don't freeze to death. When you look at political movements across the world, whether it's the teacher strikes here in the US, the yellow vest protests in France, the uprising against neoliberal privatization in Chile, and so on, and it does seem to be happening more and more lately. One thing I've always wondered, how long can these protests and these work stoppages really last? How much can these movements endure? How much leverage do they wield? Especially when we know that 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck and 46% of households in this country, the richest country in the history of the world, can't withstand a $400 emergency. As Frederick Douglass, who, by the way, people are saying, is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is being recognized more and more, I notice, said, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. One of the interesting things that I think goes underappreciated about modernity is the way that our hyper-specialization in the marketplace means that in a sense, we're all sort of outsourcing more and more of our lives to other people. In the earliest days of capitalism, that might mean that you outsourced certain parts of your life to your neighbors and your community. It makes sense that you would focus on becoming a uh, boot maker and your, your neighbor would focus on farming and you guys could maybe have a, a certain exchange. But increasingly, everything is becoming so disconnected from the locality and the community and is being so hyper-centralized in other areas and controlled by corporations that have boards that will never meet the, the people that use their products or that are affected by their policies. How many people today have the will or the ability to make and repair their own clothes or to grow and cook their own food? Effectively, the more that we centralize power and production, the more that we forfeit our own autonomy. 
the more that we sacrifice our own sovereignty. Increasing food sovereignty can be the first of many dominoes that will help ordinary people to start to regain a sense of ownership and control over their lives. So, ensuring that these basics are decentralized, distributed, and provided for by communities and individuals rather than controlled by multinational corporations that are ultimately profit-seeking, this becomes about much more than just food. It becomes about power. It becomes about political power. It becomes about security. It becomes about leverage. It becomes about freedom. Now, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, which I know is just a delivery vehicle for a George Soros depopulation Agenda 21 conspiracy of the evil Zionist lizard people and all that, urban agriculture provides fresh food, generates employment, recycles urban wastes, creates green belts, and strengthens cities' resilience to climate change. In this video series, I'm gonna dive into more detail about the economic, the social, and the environmental benefits of distributed food systems and controlled environment agriculture. We'll take a look at urban agriculture versus vertical farming, aeroponics, aquaponics, hydroponics, food sovereignty, food safety, food security, and food sustainability. So in case you're new here, the way this works is I crank the content, you smash the like button. And if you're interested in more of this type of content and wanna see what's gonna come out of this channel, then hit subscribe and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Mm. World peace.